All right, everyone there? 2 Peter chapter 2, verse number 15. Uh, let's go ahead and pick up from verse 12, where we started last Wednesday, and we'll read down to verse number 16. The Bible says, But these, as natural brute beasts, made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption." And shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. Having eyes full of adultery that, and, uh, and that cannot cease from sin. Beguiling unstable souls, a heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children. Here's where we're going to start in terms of our teaching which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bozar, or Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity, the dumb ass speaking, oh, the King James is such a great translation, the dumb ass speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water, Clouds that are carried with a tempest to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escape from them who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption." For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. Our teaching tonight is going to be on the motive and the allure of false teachers. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity tonight to gather as a church body. Father, we're thankful for these who have gathered tonight. Father, we're uh, hoping and praying that folks are tuned in or... Uh, or maybe sick, or whatever the case might be. And Father, we just pray that uh, you'd bring them back to us just as safe and sound as ever. And Father, we ask that you will bless the teaching of your word, for it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. I want you to notice here that in this entire chapter, Peter really doesn't pull any punches. Uh, every verse builds on intensity, and the descriptors about these false teachers and false, uh, and false prophets, uh, again, Paul, Peter's not pulling any punches here. Now, beginning here in verse 15, notice it says, "...which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, who loved the wages of unrighteousness." Now, you're going to notice here in verse 15, if you've read your Bible carefully, we're going to see an obvious parallel here with Jude 1, verses 8 and following. Keep your finger in 2 Peter 2 and just head over to Jude, if you would. Jude, there's only one chapter, so that should be very simple, Eloy. And then I want you to go over to Jude 1 and look at verse number 8. <coughs> Excuse me. And notice how this almost parallels what Peter wrote beginning in chapter 2, Verse number 10. So look what it says. It says, Jude 1, verse 8, Likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Now again, that's paralleling what Peter said about the angelic beings and demons and so on and how they just uh, speak evil of them and, and they're cavalier about them. And then we have verse 9, Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil... He disputed about the body of Moses, durst or dare not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke thee. But these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beasts, same, same description, in those things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward, and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. These are spots in your feast of charity, when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, 
carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out of their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. It's almost like they colluded in a room together, but uh, they didn't do that. You say, what's the, what, what happened? They know the same God. Peter and James, Peter and Jude know the same God. And so when, when you see passages like that parallel, you're going to say to yourself a question. You're going to say, I wonder why God did that. And then the answer you're going to get back is this, to reinforce what he's saying. Okay, he's reinforcing. So let's look at this. Take note, back in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse number 15, take note the free will aspect of their individual plights. Notice again, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray. Okay, this suggests that they knew the right way and willfully went the wrong way. You know how I know that they did know that? Because I know people in this church that's done that too. When they know the right thing, but just don't do it. People do it all the time. Uh, you see, folks, the problem is not what people do not know. The problem is, is what, what people do know. That's the problem. And, and that's going to be the problem all the way till either the rapture happens or the Lord uh, takes you home by way of death. People, it's not what they don't know, it's what they do know. And I do think the Bible makes it clear in the, in the Gospels, to whom much is given, much is required. And so, folks, it's important to do what you know. Now, notice also here in verse number 15, we have a reference to following the way of Balaam, the son of Bozar, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. And in Jude's account, it says, ran greedily after uh, the heir of Balaam. Uh, this is a clear indicator of the true motive of these false teachers and these false prophets. Now you say, what's the true motive and what's, what's clear? Well, what did Balaam go after? Money. And Jude says, ran greedily after the way of Balaam. So it's clear to me that the factor of motive is money. The motive is money. This is why Scripture states in 1 Timothy 6 that the love of money is the root of all evil. And nothing has changed in the human heart since the fall. Jude puts it this way, as we just said a few moments ago, and ran greedily after the error of Balaam. Now listen, contrary to what the character Gordon Gecko said in the 1987 movie Wall Street, he said greed is good. The fact is, greed is bad and only leaves you wanting more with absolutely no sense of satisfaction. This, the account that Peter references uh, of this Balaam situation is found between Numbers 22 through 25. We're not going to go through those chapters. We've done this a few times, especially when we went through Jude. And essentially tells us that Balaam accepted money to curse the Israelites by King Balak. But instead, Balaam blessed them. This money is also connected with sexual immorality, which is kind of interwoven in this chapter as Balaam entices the Israelites into sexual sins with the Moabite women in Numbers chapter 25. And so it's all there in black and white from verse 20, chapter 22 all the way to chapter 25. Now, catch what I'm saying here and don't get angry, but the ultimate irony is that Balaam was such a dumbass that God used a dumbass to restrain him. <laughs> Say what you will, God has a sense of humor. And people think I say stuff like that just to, well, kind of. But the fact is, it's true. There's no other way to explain Balaam in those chapters. In fact, the irony, the humor of it is that God would use this 
dumb donkey to be the restraining force to keep him from doing even more stupid, even though unfortunately he did. Now, these false teachers in, first, in 2 Peter chapter 1 are described quite descriptively. Notice what it says here um, in verse 16. But was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumbass speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. And of course, that's all what we just covered here briefly. And then notice the descriptors again. It's a, it's a continuation of verse number 12 where Peter starts off saying that they're natural brute beasts and so on and so forth. He picks it back up in verse 17 and says, These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. All right? So these false teachers are described as wells without water and clouds that bring promise of water, but no dice. If you will, these false teachers and these false prophets are being compared to being empty and vapid, but they promise nourishment to their followers. The way it's done today, here's how this is done today, is it's, they'll say things like this, sow your seed of faith and God will honor your faith by pouring out a blessing that you can't imagine. There's these conferences that were real popular in the 90s and the early 2000s called Seed conferences. And no, it has nothing to do with horticulture. All it is is taking your seed, which is your $100 bill or your $10 bill or your $1,000, whatever, and you're sowing that into their ministry. You're sowing it. And then the promise from them is that as you sow your seed into that ministry, God is going to bless you over and abundant. You can't even have, the, you don't have enough buckets to carry out what God's going to give you. And so the false teacher heads home with the cash while the weary follower heads home fleeced and frustrated down the road because none of what that false teacher is going to manifest itself. And if it does, it's not a gift of God. Because there's plenty of accounts in the Bible where the devil can bless some people. The devil can do it, and I don't want anyone to give me any cards and letters because I know the devil can do it. Now... What is the big allure? Why do people fall for these types of false teachers? Why do they just have throngs of followers? And I'm not just, I'm not just talking about the faith healers and the wealth and health gospel guys, although they are predominantly who I have in mind when I'm looking at this passage for the modern day. But you have to understand that nothing really has changed. When we say modern day word of faith, uh, health and wealth preachers, you understand that if you read Jonathan Edwards and if you read George Whitfield from three, four hundred years ago, you're, you will read sometimes that they ran into some preachers that believed in wealth and health. So this thing of health and wealth today, even though it's prevalent in the last 50 years in Western in Western America, um, this is not new. And if this chapter is any indicator, it was already kind of running rampant during the first century. And, And listen, who doesn't want health and who doesn't want wealth? So we asked ourselves at the outset, what is the allure? Well, notice here in verse number 18 and 19. <clears throat> For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness. Now, that's an old word that we don't always use, but wantonness is actually quite up to date if we think about it. It means wanting a lot of stuff. Wantonness, it's seduction. Wantonness. Those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. Verse 19, while they promised them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same as he brought in bondage. So, verses 18 through 19 show us what these empty clouds and what these wells without water are able to accomplish via 
words. They speak. Catch it again. Verse 18. For when they speak, great swelling words. Verse 19. While they promise them. How? Through words. Now, why am I stopping there? Because this is precisely how we're introduced to the most slithery figure in the Bible, Satan. Before we know anything about Satan, we know that he's good with his words. And it starts off with the slithery statement of, Yea, hath God said. And from that point on, Satan has got the upper hand if you're listening to the conversation. This notion of speaking is quite powerful. Now, a lot of people think, well, you have to be uh, a good-looking individual in order to have a commanding speech pattern. That isn't true. Adolf Hitler was not exactly Mr. Good-looking. Uh, Benito Mussolini wasn't exactly, wasn't exactly a good-looking... I'm trying to do a little Mussolini there. Um, for those of you that are a little savvy to 20th century dictatorship, I'm sure you've got that book that you thumb through every day. Um, Mussolini was not a good-looking guy, but he was a great orator. Uh, some of the greatest orators were short and, 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 and dictators. I mean, I mean, let's just take it. Uh, Mussolini himself was about 5'8". Uh, Hitler was about 5'8". Uh, Stalin, I think, was taller than both of them. He was about 5'10", 5'11". Uh, Napoleon was a short guy. But, but, but according to what I've... Whoa, all right, Bob's, gonna, Bob's in the Napoleon camp. Listen, Bob's in the Napoleon camp. Look at here, look at here. All right, Bob's in the Napoleon camp. And so, whatever tall or whatever he wasn't, all I know is you don't have to be Mr. Goodlooker to be a great orator. And these individuals had an ability to speak. And speaking is what duped America for two terms. Barack Milhouse Obama. Now, no, he wasn't short. I think he was about six feet tall. However, there are exceptions to this rule because we've had great speakers that were good leaders. For instance, our Savior is, was a good speaker, still is a good speaker because we can hear him still speaking. So our, our Savior is an excellent speaker. He's probably about 5'7". Um, I don't know. No, ask Bob. He knows. He's on the Napoleon camp. Um, he, who cares? Um, think about, I was going to mention somebody else, and then I just totally got, oh, Ronald Reagan. Great. The, he's called the great communicator, you know. So, and, and then you've got, you've got Trump, who's really not the greatest communicator, but is able to get little snapshots of stuff out there. Here's what Trump does. He just throws out this barrage of words. Right, that's what he does. Just a barrage of words. And, and there's like fragment here and then a fragment over here and then a fragment over here. And if somebody says, did you say this? I didn't say that. He can actually say that. He, there can be plausible deniability because there's so many words that went out. But anyway, regardless of that. The point is, they speak great sweeping words. They promise them liberty, which is interesting, financial liberty, physical liberty, emotional liberty. But the problem is, they're all words. They're all empty words. And the motivating factor, again, in how they allure the follower is in the same motive that they have themselves, which is money. Look up here. The leader, the pro false teacher, the false prophet, he's, he's into the profit motive. But so is the follower because they want what he's got. All right? So notice here. Look at that phrase in verse number 18. Verse 18 says, for when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure. How do they allure you? Through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantedness. 
In other words, the two things that the flesh longs for, the two things that your flesh longs for, I don't care if you're saved or headed to hell, there's two things that your flesh longs for, health and riches. I, I don't care. You can be spiritual. I don't care how spiritual you are. You want health and you want riches. If someone says to you, you got third degree cancer, or third degree, you got third stage cancer, your next question is, what are my options? You say, what are you saying that for? Because you want to prolong this. Either prolong it or get rid of it. Who doesn't want that? Um, and money at that point is no option, for the most part. The two things that the flesh longs for is health and riches. A man and a woman will do or give just about anything to get both. And they know that. They know that. And that is why those worldwide ministries of this day here in Peter's time and the worldwide ministries today and the worldwide ministries that were lesser known between Peter's time and when the Word of Faith movement began over 60 years ago. Now think about this. You really, these things come in cyclical cycles, uh, these false teachers and false prophets. Think about this. With the rise of a, of a true gospel, there's always got to be a rise of a false gospel. Right. Now, I'm explaining that to you. In 1948, God lays on the heart of Billy Graham to preach the gospel. And say what you want about Billy. Yeah, he compromised the last 20 years of his life. There's no doubt about that. Pope, all this junk. But he preached the gospel. Let's just give him the credit where credit is due, all right? Especially in those first formidable years. The first 20 years, I mean, it was strong. All you got to do is go on YouTube, look at his early stuff. It sounded like a fundamental Baptist. That's because he was. He was a Bob Jones University graduate. Well, anyway. But, and he bought a book for 135 bucks um, that you're paying for. So he was a Bob Jones grad, and he was a fundamentalist, and he preached with John R. Rice, and he preached with all these early fundamentalists that were really big during that time. Well, anyway, regardless of that, guess who pops up in 1951, only two or three years after, after Billy Graham? The rise of a guy named Oral Roberts. Oral Roberts University, and then his son. And Oral Roberts comes in with this, the same tents that Billy Graham was putting up in the late 40s and early 50s, you know, he had a big tent down here in Hollywood where supposedly a bunch of Hollywood stars got saved, and, and you know, that might be true, some of it. Um, Oral Roberts would put up tents and would have these healing campaigns. Now, look up here. I'm not saying God can't heal. What I'm saying is God's not going to heal through that fool. That's all I'm saying. He's just not going to heal through that fool. And so with the rise of a true gospel, there's got to be a rise of a false gospel. And the same thing today. It, you, that's why I always tell people, you've got to pick and choose your churches correctly. Because with the rise of good churches, there's also the rise of false churches. And false churches don't necessarily have to be like outright heresy. They just have to be subtle things here and there. And you have to be biblical enough to be able to sense those subtleties, right? You have to. Uh, when, when someone comes up to, if someone came behind the pulpit of this church and said the Bible is a very human book and the Bible speaks to our human needs and, and stresses the humanness of the Bible. See, on the one hand, he's right because the Bible was written by humans that God moved in the hearts of. So on the one hand, you have to say, yeah, he's right. But you have to then ask, what's he angling for? What's he angling for? Why isn't he saying the Bible is God's infallible, inerrant word? Why isn't he saying that it's without error? Uh, when, a, when a preacher says this, now catch it, this is going to sound good too. It's going to sound almost true. We should tether our faith to the resurrection and not to the infallibility of the Bible. You say, who said that? Andy Stanley, the son of Charles Stanley who pastors one of the largest churches that is gone woke in America. He had a big brouhaha with modern evangelicalism when he said that we should tether our faith to the proof of the resurrection 
which he affirms, but we shouldn't tether it to the Scripture. Now, the reason why he says that is because there are things in the Scripture that speak contrary to the cultural movement of the day. So my follow-up question would be this. Sure, Jesus Christ rose from the dead, but I wouldn't know that if I didn't have... So in reality, I've got to tether it to not only the, to the account of the resurrection, but as that account is laid out for us in the scriptures. And so you have these newfangled ideas and these nice nuanced ways of saying something where 50% of the audience goes, yeah, that's right. That sounds so really, that's smart. And then the other, there's like 20% going, you're full of crap. And those are guys like me. You know, I'm the, I'm the guy on the outs that everyone looks at and says, you just don't want to have any fun. You're right. I want to have no fun. I just want to be right. That's, that's, that's me. I'm the guy that spoils it all. And Eloy. <laughs> and then I want you to notice the final phrase in verse number 19, and we'll be done. It says, while they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. All right, so here's how I'm going I'm to summarize that. Whatever trips you up, you end up becoming a slave to it. Whatever trips you up, you end up becoming a slave to it. And I don't care what it is. It could be food. It could be anything. You see, we're always... It, shut up! Mark, go get me that bar of Hershey that's sitting on... The, ironically, I'm having you go get the Hershey bar. But anyway... But yeah, whatever trips you up, you end up becoming a slave to it. And folks, yes, it can be chocolate. It can be anything. And it doesn't have to be something spiritual, even though oftentimes it is. It can be something. And so the point of what Peter's saying here is that those false teachers will end up becoming slaves to their own desires, and those desires will be their end because you cannot continue to engage in fleshly desires consistently without those fleshly desires ultimately devouring you. And they always do and they always will. All right, praise the Lord. We'll continue to finish out that chapter next Wednesday night. We'll resume pastoral epistles with verse number 12 of chapter 1 of 1 Timothy this coming Sunday night.